to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora clan on whose land we stand today and pay my respects to their elders past and present for looking after this land and for continuing to look after this land. Goodness, after Wes, I loved what he said when he said, if you're going to screw it, don't do it. And I didn't get exactly which part, but do it is the part that I loved anyway. So I'm going to begin with just a little story and then I'll share mine. So it's during the depression and a man has not fed his family for weeks and there's been no work and he's had nothing that he could bring home. And he's walking home on another day with no food and lo and behold, he looks down, and there he finds a shiny silver shekel. And he hops and he skips and he runs to the bakery, and with half a shekel, he buys bread. And then with the other half a shekel, he goes to the flower seller on the corner and buys the biggest bunch of flowers he can, and he runs all the way home. And when he gets home, he opens the door and he hands his family the bread and they grab it and they're so excited. And then his wife looks at him and sees the flowers and she says, Are you absolutely mad? What have you done? We had nothing and you've spent it on flowers? And he looks at her and he says, My dearest, the bread is in order for us to eat, but the flowers are to make it worthwhile. And I guess each and every one of us has to find what it is that makes their life worthwhile. And I was very, very, very lucky because eight years ago I found what it is to make my life worthwhile. So it's not that when I was growing up as a little girl, I didn't plan every day that one day when I was big I was going to start a charity. Absolutely no way. <laughs> what I did think that I needed, I, I was very lucky in that um, my parents did give me good values, and particularly, as you can probably hear from my speech impediment, I was born in South Africa. <laughs> and I was taught values, and I was brought up in the apartheid era, which was not an easy time to actually knowingly give values, because all around, actually, the values that our country had chosen were immoral and my parents chose to show me that. And I was very lucky to have that. But that wasn't the overriding principles that I lived on. I was just a regular little girl who actually wanted to be a postmaster when I grew up. I had no idea why. I just thought that would be such fun. <laughs> the office still allow me to do that, you know, on the thank you or whatever. Anyway, I left South Africa and went to live on kibbutz and then went, left kibbutz after 10 years. For those of you who know what kibbutz is, I guess, again, the values, social values, equality, they were important to me, but not as important when it came time to leave kibbutz because although I loved living there, I found that actually as an individual I really wanted to prove that I could do things and it's very hard to live in a community when you actually want to be quite strong-minded and when they tell you to go and work here and you think you should work somewhere else. It's kind of quite difficult. So instead of living within that and constantly fighting, we left and we lived in Haifa for many years. By this stage I had two boys and you might have heard the music when you came in. Those are my boys. And they make me very proud and I love them very much. And I guess part of the reason for looking for more purpose in my life was that I do have these two wonderful boys, men now, but they're healthy and they're beautiful. And when we came to live in Australia, the thing that we didn't have was money. And I thought that was really important. I put my head down and my thumb up 
and work really, really hard and thought that if, you know, if I had more money, it would be good. If then we had a bigger house, it would be good. And then if we had a little bit more, it would be good and more earrings and more shoes. <laughs> and then about eight years ago, I started feeling, how many pairs of ears do I have? <laughs> How many feet do I have? My mother always used to say, how many feet do you have? I didn't understand her. I said, what difference did it make? Those shoes said, buy me. <laughs> but I reached a point that actually, it just didn't really fulfill me that much anymore. And I started wondering what it was that actually I'd been put on this earth for. During my business life, so I had built up a business and what I had done in my business was special events. So putting on, marking a unique moment in the life of either an individual or a business and making that very special. And people were spending tens and thousands and thousands of dollars doing that. And it was very special. They loved the moment and I Until I started thinking that there just had to be more to life than creating these special moments that were there for a very short while my clients were left with wonderful memories and photos and then I'd start all over again the next day with the next client and the next special moment and it just started not to feel as fulfilling <coughs> as it had felt and it wasn't because I made shit loads of money and the reason I say that is because over the last eight years I've probably had a thousand people come to me and say one day when I'm as rich as you are, I'll do what you've done. And I really, I, I don't mean to sound like a wanker, which is why I say I didn't make shitloads of money when I decided to start Oz Harvest. It was because I wanted to do something now, then, then. I wanted to feel it now in this life. I wanted to know what my legacy was, what my purpose was. Now, interestingly, in my business life, what I've been doing was putting on these events and there's one thing that's absolutely common to every single one of the events I was putting on and I'm sure the events that you might ever have been to and that is food because food is just all about community, it's all about sharing, it's all about caring and so the more special my events were and the more I needed to show that my client was abundantly generous or abundantly successful, the more food there'd be at my events because that was a way of showing how generous they were. And there's nothing worse than going to an event and standing in a corner and seeing the one waiter whiz by <laughs> and you standing over there and thinking, God, I have to go to Macca's on the way home. <laughs> and so nobody ever had to go to Macca's after my events. In fact, there was always so much food left over. And occasionally what I would do is I would take that food when I could and I'd drop it off at the only place I knew on my way home, which was the Matthew Talbot Hostel which was right behind the Porsche and the Ferrari and the, the Mercedes and all of those extraordinary dealers. And I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but at, late at night it's quite a confronting place. There could be maybe 300 men hanging around, not in the greatest shape. And it was quite difficult to manipulate and maneuver getting through them to hand over some trays of food. So eight years ago, when I was thinking about what it was that I could do that could add value, I hadn't quite decided, but I went to visit a friend of mine in South Africa. I was only there for a very short time. Her name's Selma, and she said, come with me to Soweto. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Soweto or heard about Soweto, but it's a city that probably has today four or five million people in it. Then, when Selma, the, the time Selma was telling me about, probably had a couple of million people, and she said, come with me. I knew that Selma had been an activist and a change maker. She had stayed in South Africa. I didn't know the details. She's the kind of friend that it didn't matter if you had contact or didn't when you did connect. It was a connection of the heart. She said, come with me. I'm going to visit an AIDS clinic I set up. Selma's a doctor. And as we drove into Soweto, she kind of, under her breath, quite unassumingly, 
without even thinking, said, oh, by the way, I was responsible for electricity in Soweto. And I kind of went quiet and went, wow, what can it feel like to know that you've had that kind of impact on that many people? And by the time we'd driven to the AIDS clinic, and I'd seen what she was doing there, I knew that my life could never be the same again. And that I had to find what it was, so that was kind of my light bulb moment to know that something had to change. And by the time I came back to Australia, I decided that what I was going to do was I was going to set up a food rescue organization, because what I knew was that there was food, and I knew that there were people in need, and that if I could connect those two, it possibly could be a good thing. And it seems like it has been. It took a year to set up. I thought it would take a month. <laughs> I found a model. I, I, I went to America because I quite by chance, on, you know, the universe conspires when you need it to. And quite by chance, I decided I'd visit my sister and I heard about a model of food rescue in, in LA. Well, I didn't know it was in LA. How much time have I got? Because I could talk forever and somebody needs to just tell me when it's time to shut up. I've still got 15. Oh, cool. All right, but just give me the sign when you tell me you want me to shut up. Anyway, so I, I thought, okay, I'll, I heard about, but I decided I'd go and see my sister. And then I heard that there was this food rescue organization. And when I tried to call them, all I got was, if you need food, just leave your number. And that wasn't helpful because I wanted to find the founder so I could see what the founder had done. So I called my sister I said, I'm coming to LA tomorrow and you find the founder of this organization so that I can go learn from them. Anyway, I arrive in LA the next day and I'm at the airport and I say, so have you found her or him? She says, do you think we could go home first? I said, no, because I might have to fly somewhere else in America to find this person. She said, I have a mobile number for you. She didn't. She said, I have a cell phone number for you. <laughs> I said, okay. So I get up from the airport. I pick up the phone. I dial and I say, hi, my name's Riley Khan and I'm here to tell you that what I want to do is I want to start a food rescue organization just like you've done and I can do it because I know that I can. I know people and I can do it. And while I'm doing this, I see my sister's eyeballs rolling. <laughs> and, and I kind of get off the phone and I say, what? What did I do wrong? says, you're in Los Angeles? You think that you could say, I know people? I said, but I had to tell her that I was serious, that I did know people in the industry. Anyway, I came back after a week and I did think it would take me a month. And when I phoned a couple of the, the very, very, very wealthy people that I thought would give me some money and then still haven't returned my call, I realized it didn't matter. If it took me for the rest of my life, what I was going to do was start a food rescue organization. And it took a year to set up. And in November 2004, our first van left an office that had been donated to me and written on the van. It said, rescuing food for the charities of Australia. And I pictured myself black and blue because I decided that's what I'd wanted to do and now that was our first van and in that first month we delivered the equivalent of 13,000 meals to six different charities and I thought that was extraordinary. <laughs> Last month, July 2012, we delivered 380,000 meals to 450 different agencies. So I guess we've grown a little. <laughs> I don't normally cry this much. I do normally get kind of emotional because who would have thought? It's not, you know, I didn't intend stop world hunger. I knew that I wouldn't stop poverty, but what I really wanted to do was stop good food from going to waste and delivering it to people in need. And so I guess I've succeeded in that. 
I didn't do it alone. I could never, ever have done that alone. I've got hundreds and thousands of wonderful volunteers who help us, an amazing board that helped me along the way, and extraordinary people who've helped me achieve <coughs> what Oz Harvest is today. So today, on a, every day, the moment we have 14 vehicles, but I just ordered another five because I've got funding for another five, one in Newcastle, one in Adelaide, an extra one in Brisbane, two more for Sydney, so that'll make 19 vehicles, refrigerated vehicles that collect over 130 tons of good food every single month that we waste. Australians waste $5.2 billion worth of food every year. That's good, perfectly beautiful food that's expended energy and fuel and water to produce. So until such time as we learn to eat fruit that might have a freckle or an apple that might have a blemish and buy less and buy fresh and learn to look after our universe better, I guess there'll always be food wasted. And in a way, our, our mission, although it is to rescue as much food as there is and deliver it to as many people as possible, I guess one of the ways I'll know my job is done is if there's no more food left to collect. But I don't think that's going to happen for a very long time because the way our universe is built and the way we as consumers consume it's going to take a long time till we educate everybody. So here in this room, we can all start by making a huge effort to one, value the food that we have. I know that each and every one of us, it happens that you go to the fridge and there's that lettuce that we didn't manage to eat. It's looking a bit miserable. Put it in soup, it tastes delicious. <laughs> but, um, Seriously, I think the most important thing is really what I've learned along the way. And it isn't just about rescuing food. And, and <coughs> I'm incredibly proud of, of having done that because I guess I wanted to make a difference. And, and we really, you know, Oz Harvest is the first organization that's done that. And we've, we've rescued over 5 million kilos of food delivered this week. We will have delivered our 15 millionth meal from good food that would otherwise have gone to waste to people in need. We, we have added new programs to keep making a difference. We've just rolled out an educational program called NEST, Nutrition Education Sustenance Training, which is about going into our organizations and teaching the people that we <coughs> deliver food to how to eat better, how to cook, <coughs> how to buy better, and how to use the produce that we're bringing them. I mean, a lot of the organizations that we deliver food to could never, ever afford the quality of the food that we bring them. Have any of you ever watched MasterChef? <laughs> so we were MasterChef a few weeks ago, they did a whole episode of rescuing food, and I don't know if any of you saw that, but we've been rescuing and collecting the surplus food from the MasterChef kitchen from the day they started filming. And so there's a really lovely story. Um, we delivered, we collected one of the days from MasterChef about six whole salmon that they didn't use, that they'd bought to have on display, they'd been bought from the fish market that morning, and, and that's what we collected. And um, we delivered it to two of our agencies. And the next day, I got a call from one of the agencies saying to me, Ronnie, I just want to share with you that we delivered this food. We delivered the fish and served the fish. And one of my people came up to me and said, I don't think we should eat the fish. I think it's off. <laughs> and the carer said, why do you think it's off? Because this morning, it was collected from it was bought by MasterChef at the fish market. It was taken to, in, 
to their kitchen, it was kept on ice, and then it was collected by ice harvest in a refrigerated van by a driver that's trained in safe food handling <laughs> and delivered to us. And then we cooked it and served it for you. And she said, because it was pink. <laughs> so good food is not just about nutrition, it's about education, it's about dignity, it's about sharing, it's about caring. So what have I learned? What have I learned over the last seven years? I've learned that giving is a thousand times more rewarding than getting. That no money that I've ever earned is as valuable as what I've learned. And that is that the time to give and do is right here and right now. And a lot of you may or may not think that you don't have time right now and that you should do that one day when you've got time. But it doesn't have to be big, it can be tiny. Just start by doing tiny little acts of kindness, tiny little acts of goodness, because that just ripples and multiplies out. And when you do one little good act, the person that you do it to feels so good that they start doing. So my message to you all, because you're here, because you've chosen to be here at the Conscious Club, you've chosen to, to go for enlightenment, and not entertainment that's mindless, is you all obviously so beautifully aware and think and care so deeply, and I'm sure that you're all already doing amazing things. But if you're not, find what it is that fills you, find what it is that you're passionate about, find what it is that you believe that can make a teeny weeny little difference to somebody, and go out and do it today. <laughs> We're just going to give you guys a chance to ask two questions to Ronnie. Any takers? Anyone like to? I can't see anything, so if yeah, somebody's. <laughs> So we collect food every day from delis and takeaways and boardrooms and hotels and supermarkets and food producers and food manufacturers and farmers and anywhere that there's leftover food every day and we never know what we're going to get. So to, to yesterday we might have got 700 kilos from MasterChef or we might have got 5,000 sandwiches from the convention center or we might have got three trays of ready-made lasagna from a cafe in Paddo or Double Bay or wherever and we de deliver that food in real time so our vans leave empty in the morning they'll go and pick up and then they will deliver that food to 30, 40 or 50 different organisations that feed disadvantaged Australians like the Salvos, Uniting Care, Wesley we're non-denominational so we feed Hindus, Greeks, Jews, anybody you name them, if they're in need and they are just feel for whatever reason they need to go to an organization to get food, that's who we feed. I just must say that one of the challenges was that food donors thought that they couldn't deliver food or couldn't give food away. <coughs> so in New South Wales in 2005 we had the law amended, the Civil Liabilities Act amended to allow good food to be given away for free to people in need. And we had that act amended in the ACT in 2008 in Queensland and South Australia in 2009. <laughs> Any question? Any takers? No. Okay. Yeah, Beautiful. Sorry, yes. What about places like Woolworths and Coles and David Jones? So, Woolworths, David Jones, Aldi, Costco. Woolworths, David Jones, Aldi, Costco, all give us food. Did I leave anything off? Woolworths, Aldi, David Jones, Costco, all give us food. Harris Farm give us food. They started. They've given us six, uh, I can't remember, 64 tons or 640 tons in the last six weeks. Six months. They love us. And they now, it took me seven years to get them to hear about us. And now they give us from all 18 stores in Greater New South Wales. So support them. Go support all those people who give us food. 
Yeah, yeah, they help. They give us food. Sure. Um, some, so every day we have some places that know that they'll have food left over every day, and then every day, or 30 calls. So really, we're a transport and logistics company, just that we pick up for free, we deliver for free, and our product is food. And we never know what we're going to get, and we never know when we'll get it, and we work seven days a week from 8 in the morning until 11 at night every day. Cool.